everyone. Let's try it again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I can tell everyone's distracted by the snacks. Okay. <laughs> I'm Nikina Kane. I'm one of the deputy prosecuting attorneys at the Marion County Prosecutor's Office. I handle our felony diversion program. It's nice to see everyone this evening, and thank you for joining us at the Marion County Prosecutor's Community Justice Academy. Welcome to session three. This session is titled, Elements of Setting Bail. How bail and pretrial release is determined in Marion County. This is a topic that we're asked about a lot in the community, and we thought it'd be great to feature two amazing speakers tonight to answer some of your questions. I would like to remind everyone that we do have complimentary snacks in the back. <laughs> Anyone have any trouble finding them? Okay. <laughs> also, the restrooms are located outside the double doors that you came in. Straight, directly in front of you, you'll find the restrooms if you shall need them. We would also like to remind everyone that um, if you receive an registration form, to please turn it into any of the Marion County Prosecutor's Office staff members. Can we have the staff members raise your hands? So you can give that registration form to any of the staff members that you see with their hands up, myself included. Um, providing your email and contact information on those forms is our way to be able to stay in communication with you. Um, Miss Annie is really good about sending out reminders about future events. Also links to the videos from the sessions or any other useful information. So if you're not receiving emails from the office, it's because we do not have your information on a registration form. So you could also see the folks outside the room at the table to get a form or to provide your contact information to get on the list. Very important. The last reminder is to complete your evaluation form after each session as the information is fresh in your mind. We know how it is once you step out those doors, right? Life can get hectic and we can tend to forget some things. So be sure to fill out your evaluation forms at the end of the sessions. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of both presenters. Uh, we will pass around the mic, so just be patient, raise your hand, and we will get to your questions. With that being said, I will introduce our speakers. This evening, we have Chatrice M. Flowers. She is a judge with the Marion County Superior Court Criminal Division 20, where she primarily hears major felony drug and handgun offenses. She was elected to the bench November 2014. Prior to becoming elected, Judge Flowers was a master commissioner with the Marion County Superior Court Criminal and Civil Divisions for over nine years. As a master commissioner, she presided over criminal court hearings, bond reviews, jury trials, evidentiary hearings, court trials, probation revocation hearings, and civil court hearings. In the initial four years of her legal career, she was a deputy public defender. Judge Flowers is an Indianapolis native and graduate of North Central High School. A 1995 graduate of DePaul University, <coughs> onward she attended the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law and received her Doctor of Jurisprudence in 1998. Judge Flowers is married to Kevin L. Moore. She is a member of Light of the World Christian Church and serves as the church council president. Judge Flowers is also on the DePaul University Board of Visitors and is an active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Alpha Mu Omega Chapter. Our second <coughs> presenter is Deputy Prosecuting Attorney T.K. Morris. T.K. Morris is a supervisor in our major felony division. He primarily handles cases in Court 3 and has over 12 years of legal experience with the Marion County Prosecutor's Office. He has extensive trial experience, including numerous major felony jury trials. He is regarded as a great mentor and teacher to those that he supervises. 
and he is known for his very entertaining uh, <laughs> legal trainings that he provides with the office. I look forward to them. TK is an amazing litigator, and he also um, enjoys spending time with his family. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, if we can give a warm welcome to our first presenter, TK Morris. All right, good evening, everyone. It is really fantastic to see so many folks here tonight and uh, to talk about the Marion County bond system. So thank you all for being here. You're gonna have to forgive me. If you cannot hear me, it's because I naturally want to move around. And so if I move around, I'm gonna be moving away from the microphone. So just wave at me or tell me, hey, get back to the mic, TK. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yes, it's, it's been a joy to practice in Marion County as a prosecutor. Uh, it's, it's been now almost 18 years that I've been in Marion County as a prosecutor. It's the only job that I know. Uh, I love it and have loved to serve this community and serve all of you. Um, so with that, the bond system, I was thinking about the bond system and my personal introduction to the bond system was with the game of Monopoly. Okay. And uh, if you recall, in Monopoly, you go to jail and uh, you've got to roll the dice, and if you don't roll doubles, you stay in jail for three turns, <laughs> and then you're released. Obviously, the Marion County uh, bond system, a lot more complex, very different than what I recall playing <laughs> games uh, with my family when I was a kid. So what is the purpose of a bond in a criminal case? Bail is to assure the defendant's appearance in court or to assure the physical safety of another person or the community if the court finds by clear and convincing evidence that the defendant poses a risk to the physical safety of another person or the community. That's a long way of saying basically what I've highlighted there, the two key portions are the court and the prosecutor's office, the, the community, the key aspects of bond are to ensure two things. That is to ensure the defendant's appearance and to ensure the physical safety of the community. I can tell you as a prosecutor, we obviously want the defendant to appear, okay? But there are times where the defendant does not appear for court. Uh, and there are even times where as a prosecutor, we can try a case where the defendant is not present. So, Speaking just for me personally, as a deputy prosecutor, when I read this, I put greater emphasis on the physical safety of the community. Our concern, our care are for the witnesses on a case, those folks that might be afraid or scared, those folks who maybe were hurt or injured, alleged to have been hurt or injured by the defendant that's been charged. And, uh, and in general, those folks who maybe didn't have any interaction with the defendant, but our fear that the defendant's actions both then and in the past set up the community that there's the potential for somebody else to be hurt. And so our focus, again, as I read that statute, it's those two words, their appearance and the physical safety of the community, but I really hone on, it's the physical safety of the folks in our, in our great community that uh, we're concerned about. So with that, there are several types of bonds. Um, <clears throat> and looking at bond definitions, there is what is called a cash bond. And a cash bond is a bond that must be posted using the total amount of cash. So if, if someone receives a cash bond of say $10,000, that $10,000 amount then the entire amount must be posted in order for that individual to make bond to get out of jail. But uh, with that, when they post that $10,000, when it's a cash bond, that individual or the person that posted it is eligible to receive that entire amount back um, when the case is concluded, whether there's a, a conviction or uh, the defendant is found not guilty or there's a plea agreement the defendant then or whoever posts that is eligible to receive that money back. 
There are instances, though, and Judge Flowers will be able to speak to this some too, but there are instances, though, where the judge may determine that amount that's been posted is an amount that uh, there may be a portion of that that is a fee that must be paid. Uh, and sometimes what I have seen with some frequency is, let's say for an example, there's a burglary of uh, someone's shed. And out of the shed, there is a $200 lawnmower that's been stolen. Person posts the cash bond. Well, that when the time comes for the case to be concluded, let's say that individual is found guilty or pleads guilty, that lawnmower is worth $200. Well, before the court gives that entire amount back, the court may order that a portion of that amount is paid in restitution so that, again, one of the goals here is to try to make the victim whole in that type of situation, which sadly cannot always be done in criminal cases, but the goal is to make that victim whole, and so that restitution then is going to come from that cash bond and can be ordered. So maybe that person only gets a portion of that cash bond back when they're posting it. Surety bond is an instant where a licensed bail agent becomes involved and the individual has to post 10% through the licensed bail agent, 10% of that bond. It's, uh, it's really kind of a form of insurance. It's trying to ensure that the individual appears, the licensed bail agent then posts the entire bond, but that money that the individual had to pay to the licensed bail agent they don't get that money back. So they go through the bail agent at $1,000 uh, for that $10,000 bond. They're paying that 10%, but they're not going to see that back. And then it's an additional incentive for the bonds, bondsman or bondswoman to make sure that the individual shows up for court or they can ultimately <coughs> lose then uh, that, that bond that they have then paid. Um, and I put both cash bond and surety bond in yellow letters here because those are, at least in the court that I've practiced in and the courts that I've been in, those are the instances, those are the types of bonds that I see most frequently uh, are cash bonds and surety bonds. And with some frequency as well, you'll see a combination of the two bonds. Um, a court will make a determination to set a cash bond and a surety bond. And you might say, well, what, what does that mean exactly? Well, if it's a $10,000 bond, I've been using that example. Maybe the court sets it at $5,000 cash and $5,000 surety. And I think uh, Judge Flowers, when she comes up, she'll be able to speak to it even better than I could speculate on it, why sometimes maybe the cash bond might be more appropriate in an instance and the surety bond may be more appropriate in another. There is also uh, a percent bond this is one that uh, I have not seen in the court that I practiced in. I, I am in criminal courtroom three uh, in Marion County, uh, and that's with Judge Sheila Carlisle. has been the judge in there the entire time I've been in there. I have not seen a percent bond. That doesn't mean that there aren't times where it's appropriate or there aren't circumstances where there's, it's appropriate, but it's similar to a surety bond, but a percent bond requires a person to pay 10% of the total bond amount However, a licensed bond agent is not required to post the bond. Any person can do it. And a percent bond, also called a PR bond, is refundable if there are no fees, fines, or restitution ordered once the case is resolved. And then a kind of lastly mentioned here is an XR bond, and that is a combination of a surety bond and a percent bond. key from the types of bonds, at least if, from my standpoint, is you, you, if you're wanting to kind of take bullet points that you take with you in terms of folks that you talk to about this, frequently you're going to see cash bonds and surety bonds and you're going to see the combination thereof. The cash bond, you got to pay it all, anybody can pay that. The surety bond, you're paying 10% and that's through a licensed bail agent. Who's eligible to receive bond? Well, the Indiana Constitution, Article 1, Section 17, requires bail for all offenses other than murder and treason. So if you are charged with an offense, unless it is murder or treason, or, as I might joke, if you're one of my three children, 
because they all get they all get no bond when we charge them with an offense at home. You are you're eligible for a bond. Um, I, I asked around the office today, because in my time in the office, uh, almost 18 years now, I have never heard of anyone being charged with treason. And I asked a few <laughs> other folks in the office if they had heard of or had a case involving treason. They had not. So the Constitution references treason, but in, in practice, murder is really, it, it, that's the case where you're going to see a no bond hold. And, it's refreshing to me when I when we charge murder and I'm able to talk with the victim's family or meet with the victim's family and explain to them the defendant is, at least for purposes of, of that case where uh, it's only a set term of years mm -hmm. that we're looking at, the defendant is right where we want him or her to be as the state, as the prosecution, what we've alleged, and they're not going anywhere, they can't make a bond. Whereas any other type of case, uh, you could have a family member swoop in, even if we don't think that the individual has that amount to pay to get out. Anything can happen, and, a, and an individual can, in fact, make bond on any other type of case. With murder, there are also rare circumstances where there's what's called, uh, there can be a, what we refer to as a let to bail hearing. And basically what that means, and often what happens <coughs> in practice is that the defense or the defense attorney files a motion with the court asking for a review of the bail. And at a let to bail hearing, a judge is gonna decide whether to grant bail to a person charged for an offense for which there is no bail. Uh, every instance I've ever seen it in is in a murder case. And I have had those hearings. And basically what we have is we have a type of kind of miniature trial where we're presenting evidence um, the rules of evidence, what you might hear on TV, like hearsay and leading and those things, <laughs> those don't really apply at a let to bail hearing. Um, we're presenting to the court to say this is what we have and the court has to make a determination based on what we presented. Is it still appropriate for, um, for this individual to have a no bond hold? Uh, it's kind of a fail safe if we have charged someone with murder uh, we are talking about someone's freedom, and we don't take that lightly, and the court, the judges don't take that lightly either, and so they're, they're looking at this to make a determination, is this an appropriate circumstance where the individual should have no bond, and is the state meeting at least a, uh, a kind of a low threshold here, showing that proof is evident, or that the presumption of guilt is strong to make this a non-bailable offense. I can tell you in practice, most all of the cases we ever file, we don't even have a hearing like this. And when we do, uh, the state is set, we're, we are ready to handle this. And I, I have not had an instance uh, where the individual then was given a bond. Um, they, they've always remained with no bond hold. But it does, in some respects, it does give the defense a little mini preview or a miniature preview of what the state is intending to present, more so than maybe what is in some documents. I saw this as I was looking at bail bonds. <laughs> you may notice beneath the governor's mansion, mansion is uh, the state of Illinois seal. And I grew up in the great state of Illinois, in Peoria, <coughs> Illinois, about three hours west on 74. And uh, I am ashamed to say yes. that four of the last eight governors oh, no. have uh, served time in federal prison. Wow. So uh, you, Democrats and Republicans alike in Illinois. So uh, we're doing pretty well. Our, I think many of our recent governors have stayed above that, that uh, low threshold. So and I do like the location, 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 because you frequently see in, uh, in Indianapolis, if you're ever down by the city county building, you'll see a lot of bail bonds agents, because that's where the action's at. That's where folks are going to spend their money. And, uh, and again, this is, uh, you know, this is the market dictating, at least in Illinois, where a bail bouncement should, should play location. So, I love Illinois, though. I'm Illinois through and through, but. All right, so what statutory factors can a judge consider in assessing bond? Uh, and again, 
think of it through the lens of and look at it through kind of the threshold of the appearance is what we're concerned about, making sure the courts want to make sure the defendant appears for court and the physical safety of the community. So length of residence in the county, um, if, uh, if an individual lived in California for 40 years and the individual's been here for two months uh, and picked up an offense, <clears throat> that may be something that's going to kind of raise some eyebrows both with the state and we're going to present that to the court and probably with the, with the judge as well because the concern could be, well, that individual's going to go back to California and it's going to be difficult for us to handle whatever case that may be for us to get that money back for that lawnmower that was stolen out of the shed. Uh, employment history, family ties and relationships, character and mental condition, criminal history, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more here in a few minutes, but criminal history is certainly a big one that the court's going to look at. What is the defendant's criminal background, criminal past? If this is somebody that's been through the system many times before, then that's going to give great pause uh, to the court in making a determination as to the amount of bond to set. Prior failures to appear for court, um, <clears throat> the best predictor of the future in my consideration is the past, is history. And so if somebody's been failing to appear for court before, then uh, the court's going to look at that and say, well, you're, we want the bond to be set at a threshold where there's a strong incentive to appear for court again. Um, the nature of the offense uh, is wildly important. In fact, the nature of the offense, we'll get to that also here in a minute, but that is going to be kind of where the uh, cash amounts start. That's going to be, that's going to give the court great guidance into mm -hmm. where they kind of start the amount and uh, where they go from there. Uh, immigration status, from the prosecutor standpoint, that's one that we're, we're, we're less concerned about. Um, again, that could be a length of residency in the county, whether it's California or, uh, you know, Europe. If you've only been in the county for a couple months, then we're going to, then that's going to raise our eyebrows. We're going to be concerned that somebody's not going to stick around. Um, uh, instability, disdain for authority. I could, I could sit up here for another hour and give you all examples of folks and things that they have said to judges. Uh, and while they're in, while here they are in court for the first time or, or where it's one of the first times where they're having the bond hearing and the disdain for authority just gives you a clue, hey, this person doesn't, even in this moment, one of the darkest times for them, the person doesn't take it seriously. The bond is going to the bond is going to go up appropriately if uh, those individuals are not uh, respectful in court as they should be, um, and those are all again through the Indiana Code. So this was what I was talking about earlier, looking at the Marion County bail schedule. These are there are six levels of felonies, and we'll get to level six here in a minute. But level one and level two, so level one. Uh, I'm going to try to give some examples. Level one would be an attempt murder, for example. Level two would be a voluntary manslaughter. That is murder uh, acted on in sudden heat or a crime of passion. Um, level three, you're going to talk about a robbery with a deadly weapon would be an example of a level three felony. Level four felony would be an unlawful possession of a firearm by a serious violent felon and a whole... I'm only touching on a, on a couple of charges here. Level five felony would be, say, that burglary of that shed, uh, not a, a detached shed. That would be a level five felony. And this is where the court starts the point. So it, for a level one felony, for example, um, that attempt murder, let's say the defendant that we've alleged attempt murder on uh, has no negative factors against them comes into court uh, with no criminal history, they're going to be looking at the starting point being $50,000. So it's going to go up from $50,000 if they have some of those other things going on in their background. Looking more at the Marion County Bail Schedule Level 6 felonies, bonds are frequently going to start at $500 or $250 cash bonds. And people are uh, released on their own recognizance in Marion County if they're charged with theft possession of marijuana or operating a vehicle as a habitual traffic violator. Um, and that is, I think the bail schedule is something that's determined 
uh, through, uh, there's a number of folks that are involved in making these determinations, but it's the judges, I think largely, and Judge Flowers can tell me if I'm, if I'm missing this, but there is a criminal term uh, with judges that speak to this, and then there's a general term, and then it eventually is decided and, and sort of codified in a local rule. Every county has different local rules in terms of how they make determinations on things, and, uh, and this is how things have been determined in terms of where we start with level one and level two felonies at 50,000 all the way down to where folks are released on their own recognizance. When we talk about those amounts and we're talking about the bond or the bail schedule, we're talking about uh, those amounts doubling for each of the following circumstances. So if you're not a Marion County resident, and you say you're from Peor I'm from Peoria, Illinois, you're from Peoria, Illinois, you don't live in Marion County, that is gonna cause that bond to double. So you've got that F5 case, that $7,500 amount, it's gonna double to 15,000. If the crime alleged involved a deadly weapon, it's gonna double. That F5 case for the burglary where I stole a lawnmower from the shed, it's not gonna double with that one because of the deadly weapon. Let's say the defendant has done a crime where it's alleged two or more victims. That can cause the bond to double. If the defendant has two or more prior felonies, let's say I've got two prior times where I've committed a burglary like that, that's gonna double it again from that 15, then the bond's at 30,000. Uh, if I've, and I failed to appear before, it doesn't matter whether it's here or someplace else, I failed to appear for court two or more times, that's gonna cause the bond to double again, I'm gonna be at 60,000 and I've got 10 or more prior arrests in my past, um, it's gonna cause it to double. And 10 or more prior arrests, the courts usually, at least the court that I am in, is, is looking at all types of arrests. Occasionally the court may look at, say, a public intoxication arrest or one of the less serious offenses um, and, and not give that, maybe that same weight that some other arrests would. But this is 10 prior arrests. This doesn't matter whether you were convicted of those offenses or not. You've been arrested before, this is cause for concern, this is cause for alarm. Um, and, uh, and then defendant's been arrested for an offense while on probation, parole, bond, or released on the person's own recognizance. That is almost an automatic double because the court is looking and saying, wow, this is a time where the person had the privilege of probation, the person had the privilege of being out on bond, and they previously were arrested in that process. Well, that's our whole concern, folks. We don't want you going out and right. doing another offense or causing harm to the community. We want to make sure you appear and we want to keep the community safe. So that's going to cause a, a, a judge to pretty quickly say, okay, your bond is your bond's going to be doubled on that. And maybe even more. There are extenuating circumstances, and I think most judges try to do the best they can. They're looking at the bail schedule as a guide. This is not a, you know, here's the nail, here's the hammer, boom, that's it. Um, there are extenuating circumstances where maybe a defendant doesn't have all these things, but their bond should be higher. There are other factors to consider. Maybe a defendant has that burglary of that shed and the lawnmower, but uh, they, they demonstrate evidence that they're a caretaker for an elderly uh, mom at home and um, they've got great ties to the community and maybe the bond should be slightly lower. The court has this as a guide and the court uh, it certainly has its discretion to make determinations as to how to, how, how to go about setting that bond. I do think frequently we will see the bond max out at $200,000. So the bond is gonna double to, to a degree, but it's gonna stop usually around $200,000 unless it, there are certain violent offenses where the court will allow it to double beyond that. Um, there's always exceptions in the law, right? So if, if the court makes that judgment call that it should be more than 200,000, then the court can. Certain financial crimes where the court knows this individual has alleged, been alleged to have taken a tremendous amount of money and a $200,000 bond isn't gonna mean anything, they're gonna to wanna to make the bond um, higher in that instance. So the court has this as a guide, but they certainly still have the discretion. I know the court I'm in frequently follows the bail schedule. It takes a lot for them to deviate one way or the other. 
And there's benefit to that because then the defendant isn't asking for a bond hearing when they know or they've heard from somebody else who's in custody, uh, that judge is gonna set the bond in this fashion and they're hearing from their attorney, this is what it's gonna be. So we don't want to take, take it into the court, waste the court's time or make the court, what are we doing here? You've been arrested before when you were out on probation and you've got two or more prior felonies and we doubled what was the bond twice. What are we doing? Why is there some compelling reason that we're here that we're spending the community's resources and time to have this hearing? So there is something to be said about that consistency where the court is setting the bond um, and both the expectation of the prosecutor, the public defenders, the private uh, uh, defense bar, and to the defendants who start to know, hey, this is how the bond is set in that particular court. Uh, <clears throat> People will be released on their own recognizance for all misdemeanors except the following misdemeanors, carrying a handgun without a license. Um, obviously, you know, there's, there's a heightened and I think an appropriate sense of urgency as it comes to, to guns when someone is possessing a gun that they shouldn't have. Um, uh, a batter, batteries, domestic offenses, those are frequently situations where the concern is that that individual is going to go back to uh, that loved one or that family member um, where, where we're wanting to avoid that. And so I think the courts are able to look at that and pull that out and say, this is one we're gonna set apart from the other misdemeanors. And again, try to keep the community safe. Um, operating while intoxicated with a prior conviction is one also where the court's gonna say, this is not an automatic release on your own recognizance. You're, you're probably looking at a small bond in that circumstance. Um, there are, Additional restrictions that can be imposed uh, when a court releases someone. Um, GPS monitoring uh, can be put in place where an individual is, it makes bond and is on a GPS device and then is monitored. I had a case this last year uh, where that, was, that came up time and time again where the individual was not supposed to go to certain areas uh, couldn't be in certain regions that the victim might be in that area and that GPS monitoring is then followed. So it's an additional kind of safeguard for, again, the safety of the community. Um, and even judges sometimes will uh, institute home detention where that person can get out, that person can work, but besides that, they're gonna need to be home. And usually the GPS monitoring is gonna go hand in hand with the home detention because uh, we're gonna wanna know where they are. And then uh, obviously no contact orders are frequently put in place and the no contact order is, is uh, a no contact order means not just that the defendant can't have contact with that individual, but it means they can't have anyone else indirectly contact that individual. They can't email, they can't text, they can't Facebook, they can't Snapchat, they can't have anybody else do that. And if they violate any of these restrictions, it is a privilege. And the court can say, okay, you're done. You know, you violated this. You're going back into custody, no bond. And that does happen from time to time. And I have no doubt uh, Judge Flowers has seen that happen uh, from time to time. There are other circumstances as well where a defendant will be held where there's, uh, maybe there's a federal immigration case there's a federal crime that's charged, so there's a federal hold on the individual. Another county may have a warrant or a pending case um, where that individual, you know, we might have a bond here, but if the defendant's got another case in another county where the bond's really high, what, what's the point of the defendant trying to make bond here? And a defendant may even have a warrant or a pending case in Marion County where frequently what happens is then that bond is um, revoked and the individual then has no bond hold. So the no bond hold applies to the murder and treason in our constitution, but there are plenty of instances where a defendant is gonna get a no bond hold, where if they get out and they mess up while they're out, and it isn't always just picking up a new case, it could be some violation of uh, the terms and conditions of their release, that's gonna cause also for them to be revoked. And, uh, um, and then I, I couldn't help myself here because I just kept saying bond all day. So I thought <laughs> if we're doing if we're doing a bond if we're, if we're doing a bond 
presentation. Uh, I was going to have Gold Bond in there because I love Wheel of Fortune, and that's always advertised on Wheel of Fortune. But this is way cool. This is way cool. So, um, does anyone? I I would love to pass the mic now to Judge Flowers. Um, and then I think what might be best, if you guys do have questions, then maybe afterwards, Judge Flowers and I can both uh, try to answer some of those questions. Okay, good evening. Okay, TK was extremely informative. <laughs> he did a great job about bonds. Um, good evening. My name is uh, Judge Chatrice Flowers, and I am the judge in uh, Marion County Criminal Court 20. And I hear primarily uh, major felony drug cases and major felony gun cases. So when talking about bond this evening, I'm just solely speaking about my experiences in Court 20. Each court is separate, um, and each judge handles things differently. Uh, I'll start off with telling you that when we look at bond, meaning myself and the other judicial officer um, that works in court 20 with me is Commissioner um, Jim Snyder, the first thing we look at is the level of the offense. So drug offenses, um, the highest drug offense is a level two felony. And so on the bond form that um, TK showed you that highest bond is 50,000 surety. And there are certain instances where the bond can be increased and the bond can be doubled. So primarily that's the first thing we look at when we see a new case. We look at what's the highest level of the offense. We then go to look at the criminal history of the defendant. We look at the times that the person has failed to appear because sometimes we can't just look and see their employment history. If we have a bond review hearing, we'll learn their employment history and their length of residency. But those are the primary things that we look at. The nature of the highest level offense, the person's uh, failure to appear, if they have failed to appear, and their criminal history. Primarily in court 20, we have um, surety bonds, which are we call SR bonds, which are SR, and then we also hear the, uh, we see the PR bonds. And so that's, those bonds are both 10% bonds. Surety bond is to a bail bondsman, and then the PR bond is to the clerk's office, and it's 10%. And TK touched on this early on. In the PR bonds, the person has the ability that posted the bond to get the bond back. However, I can tell you, the majority of the time that does not occur because what happens in court 20, and some other courts do this as well, when a person has posted bond, at the end of their case, there are fines, court costs, there are fees assessed. If a person goes on home detention or if they're placed on probation, then what the judge will do, myself or my commissioner, Judge Snyder, we will issue an order, an order that those fees be used to offset, that bond be used to offset those fees that the person has. And so I was helping out the staff today and I was answering the phone and the person on the phone might know that it was the judge. And so a lady had a question regarding a bond and she had paid a 20,000 PR bond, $2,000 cash, and there was $1,995 available for her to get back. So she thought the clerk takes um, a $5 fee. And so she had a question to the clerk and then she had been transferred to the court and she was supposed to go back to the clerk and so I happened to answer the phone and I was assisting her. And so the person had been assessed, this defendant, fines, court costs, fees, there was a statutory drug interdiction fee that was imposed of about $800. And so her question was, well there's about $1,100 left. Well, there had also been a bond um, form request that was filed by Marion County Community Corrections. And so we had ordered on October 1st that after the fines, court costs, fees be taken out of the bond, that 
the bond then go to offset the cost of community corrections because the person is going to be on home detention for some time. And so she said that no one had explained this to her uh, when she posted the bond. And so I pulled up the bond form because we have the ability to do that in the computer system. And on, it's a one page form that when you post a bond for someone, and it is in the print that says it's subject to fines, court costs, and fees, and it has some other language. So please be mindful that if you post a bond on behalf of someone, or if you have a loved one that posts a bond on behalf of someone, they often focus on they'll get that bond at the end of the case, but typically they do not. And especially in instances where there are crimes, where there are victims and there's a conviction, because those victims are entitled to their restitution, like in a burglary case like TK was talking about. And judges will order that that restitution um, be satisfied first. Because with case consolidation, I recently have had a couple of cases that I've sentenced some people charged with burglary. And the first thing that I did was order that the bond be applied to restitution before it goes to the fines, court costs, and fees. Because we want to make sure that the victims are made whole. So in court 20, again, we primarily use surety bonds and we primarily use PR bonds. I can tell you we use surety bonds um, when a person has out-of-county criminal history and out-of-state criminal history. That's when we use that. And we use PR bonds um, when a person pretty much does not have any criminal history outside of Marion County. I'm going to open it up now, too, because, again, TK was very informative to what questions that you all have regarding uh, bond. And I see hands starting to go okay. up. <laughs> so I'm here. <laughs> this gentleman over here, I think, with the red hat, had his hand raised. I was wondering on the uh, security bond, since you don't have the cash, does anyone have to pay anything out of that, the bondsman or anything? You said for restitution on the cash bond, you try to get something back to the victim. So a cash bond as well as a PR bond where 10% cash goes to the clerk, those two bonds are eligible to when there is a crime with a victim to go to the victim, and those two bonds go to fines, court costs, and fees, and community corrections and or probation fees. The surety bonds do not. That 10% goes to a bail bondsman is not subject for the person that posted it to receive that back. I don't know, and I can't address specifically regarding California, but I can tell, tell you that there has been um, a nationwide push and there has been some controversy specifically about bonds. Here in Indiana, I can tell you there is a criminal rule 26, which the Indiana Supreme Court is in the process of implementing. Marion County is currently doing that on a pilot project right now with a number of other counties and that's basically where people charged with misdemeanor and low-level felony offenses are being released on their own recognizance. We mirror that primarily now in Marin County just because of the volume of the cases we have. Marin County here's 25 percent of the cases um, that the other counties in the state do. So we don't have the room in our jails per se for low-level misdemeanor offenses. We just don't. So the majority of our 
people charged with misdemeanors in Marion County or OR uh, or released on their own recognizance. The majority of people charged with level six felonies are released on their own recognizance. And I mean, even when they get arrested and they're released and they pick up a second and pick up a third case, they're just being released. So we don't hold a lot of people here in Marion County um, for small offenses. If they're in jail in Marion County, and especially in court 20 in my court, uh, they have a higher bond and it's not because of it's a misdemeanor or level six felony offense. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, Judge Flowers, with respect yes. to uh, domestic violence cases, is it recommended that if there's a protective order that GPS is used also? Yes, and oftentimes, I believe in court 16 and court 17, once a bond is posted, I believe those judges do primarily order that GPS um, is a condition of the person's release so that they do not have contact with the alleged victim, or if they do or go near the alleged victim, that that is a violation. You're welcome, Mr. Burke. It's good to see you. <laughs> he did. <laughs> good evening. I have two questions. The first one is when they talked about the doubling of bonds yes, outside of Marion County, so even if the person is from Hancock County, it still gets doubled. Any county outside of Marion County. That's a possibility. If they have, if a person resides in another county and they come into Marion County and commit an offense, even though it's Hancock County, then yes, that is bond is subject to doubling because they don't live in our jurisdiction. His side of the line. And then, <laughs> and then the other one is what generally what percentage of people that are post bail, uh, I guess you call these bonds, jump bail and don't show up for court? I can tell you, I don't know as far as other courts. Um, I can tell you it does happen sometimes. And most often when you have a surety bond, a person is less likely to fail to appear. But I can tell you, I had a case recently that a person was out on a hundred and $50,000 bond, I think. I have my chief bailiff here this evening and my senior bailiff. And I think it was a $150,000 bond. They know what I'm referring to. The person's case had been pending for 11 months. They were out on bond for a level two dealing offense. They picked up another level two dealing offense. And preliminarily, the bond was set at no bond. I, did, I lifted the no bond and I set another $150,000 surety bond. Um, that was on a Friday. It was an early Friday in September because I was at the judicial conference. We set the initial hearing. That person posted bond that Saturday. They were set for an initial hearing either that Monday or that Tuesday and they did fail to appear. Just that quick. Just that quick. So it happens. It does happen that people do. So is that where bounty hunters come in? So yes, and, and actually at that, initial, at that initial hearing that the defendant was supposed to be there, the first bondsman was there from the original case and the new bondsman was there on the new case because they wanted him to sign some paperwork and he did not appear. He did not. Thank you. Oh, wow. Yes, is that sometimes, does that sometimes cover medical expenses for the victim of a crime? If they have sought that in restitution, then yes, then that can occur. That can occur. You're welcome. <laughs> I think there were some more questions. Thank you. Okay, I have two questions. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Um, the first question is, I don't know if this is just the movies, but are there, are there <laughs> cases where people can use like their house and stuff like collateral for uh, bonds and different things like that? I have heard that. It is up to the bail bondsman to determine what that 10% is. So that would be a question that a bail bondsman would be able to answer. 
I have heard stories that people do at times, as you said, they have to, they put up a portion of cash and then whatever they don't have in cash of that 10%, they can deed over if they have some property that's worth $15,000 and the bond is, you know, 200,000, then that is a possibility. Okay, and my second question was, if you find, um, does it matter to the court if with the doubling of fines and different things like that, so the hardship of maybe the person who's committed the crime or the family member, does that matter? So, or is it just the rule of this is what the bond is? If it's brought to the court's attention, sometimes at a sentencing hearing, the defense attorney will say, Judge, I know this bond is there and you're likely going to take it. However, this family member or this friend posted that bond and they were really looking to get that money back. Um, so that is something we take into consideration at sentencing hearing. If the defense attorney brings it to the judge's attention, we do consider that. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Person starts starts off with their bond is fifty thousand dollars, and then they have those other things, and you said it doubles for the first one of the things, so that make a hundred thousand dollars. Yes, sir. And then when it doubles again, is it double up the hundred thousand, double up the fifty? It just depends. I've seen bonds. I mean, I've issued a bond. I think two hundred thousand is probably, um, and above that, typically we do no bond, but. I can say there are times early on when I came into court 20, I can remember issuing like a $250,000 bond, but we've had some recent changes to our uh, bond system to the local rule regarding bond and bail in Marion County within the last year. So I'm thinking about when I issued a $250,000 bond, and that was when I was using XR bond sum, that was around 2015 when I first came into court 20. questions but um, to start off the bond is the bail of bond is returned at the end of the case correct it regardless can. of the outcome if there's no restitution or anything correct well if the case is dismissed then the person is subject the bond money goes back the court does not keep uh, does not assess a fine if the case is dismissed okay. if a person is acquitted or found not guilty then the court does not keep, and that means if they've gone to trial, the court, at least court 20, we do not keep any portion of the bond. Now, if a person has been found guilty and fines, court cost fees, um, in my court, a drug interdiction fee might be assessed for a drug offense, then the court can take a portion or all of the bond. And that is when the case ends and sentencing is Yes, that's when the case is ends and the sentencing has occurred. The bond is not subject to be returned while the case is pending. So if you have someone who is sentenced to um, home detention or the GPS monitor put on probation with a suspended sentence, they still get their money back at the end of the case? Well, oftentimes what happens is, like I, the scenario I explained earlier, is that probation will file a memorandum with the court asking that part of that uh, bond be used to offset the cost of probation. Okay, I guess what I'm saying is if there's money left over after those costs, yes. do they get them immediately after sentencing, even if it's something where they're gonna be out in the public with you know, GPS? No, not detention? immediately. The person has to request the bond. Let me say that. The person has to go to the clerk's office and they have to fill out a bond refund order and request that it be returned. So can they get it? There's no reason that they can't have it before their GPS monitor sentencing is over. No, they can't get it before because the court wants to have assurances that the person is going to return to court. Thank you. That's what I was trying to get. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I was no, looking for an incentive to see, you know, how do they get these people to follow through on their own once okay. sentencing is complete? I'm sorry. I probably didn't ask that. Oh, no. Well. That's fine. But thank you for working with me on that one. Oh, you're welcome. No problem. What does that look like when 
I'm not in a domestic violence court, and I've not been a judge in a domestic violence court, or not even when I was a commissioner, so I am sorry. I just know that they do um, impose, Judge Kleiman and Judge Davis in court 16 and 17, they often impose a bond and GPS monitoring. I do know that in having conversations with them. My question is about ill-gotten gains or, or dirty money that a, a drug dealer might be using to make bail. Okay. Uh, how do you handle that seemingly kind of complicated situation? Do you follow up and find out where this money might be, you know, <laughs> ill-gotten gains? Uh, no, we do not follow up with, um, to answer your question where the money is obtained. Um, but. You know, if it's a surety bond, the person, a family member of the person charged with selling drugs has gone to a bail bondsman. And if it's a PR bond or a cash bond, then a family member or friend of the person charged with um, selling drugs goes to the clerk. And so, no, we don't investigate where the money comes from. <laughs> the courts don't investigate. Yes, ma'am. A drug interdiction fee is assessed? What is that? So it's a statutory fee when a person is charged with a drug offense and once they are convicted of a drug offense, the court can impose that a minimum of $200 and a maximum of $1,000. Just like if there is a gun offense, there is a safe school fee. The minimum fee for that is $200 and I think the maximum fee for that is $1,000. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I don't think you've asked the question. Uh, on the bond refund or the clients or whatever you want to call it, told that mind. they can apply for that? <laughs> Are the defendants told that they can apply for it? The defendants aren't told that, but typically the person that posts the bond, the bond goes back to the person that posts it, not to the actual defendant. So it, um, it is on the paperwork, and I think people automatically assume that once the case is over, I'm going to get it back. And that's why I was saying that the court often takes that for fines, court cost fees, and especially in restitution. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Okay, my, this is the last question. Okay, so if you have a client or a defendant who is on the program, Report and they've been um, charged for restitution. If they do not, a lot of times you get arrested, you lose your job, you lose everything. So if they do not have the money to pay and they eventually start working after, is for restitution, are their wages garnished or how is it a secure way to know that the victim is going to get what's owed to them? Well, sometimes part of plea agreements, um, or if a person has been convicted and a judge sentences them, if the amount is so great, like say that there's restitution owed in $20,000 and the person's going to go to prison and then they're going to be placed on probation, obviously when they're in prison, they cannot satisfy that monetary obligation. So sometimes a civil judgment is entered for a portion of the money owed in restitution as part of the plea agreement or the court will order that. And sometimes what occurs is, is that um, a civil judgment can be entered for part of it and then they have to pay a part of it as a term and condition of their probation or term and condition of their community correction sentence. Okay, but they don't garnish Well, as far as, I think it can get to that point, but the courts don't handle that aspect. We enter a civil judgment and then once the civil judgment gets entered, then it might be steps after that for garnishment, okay. but the courts specifically don't. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I see our elected prosecutor here, Mr. Curry. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi, um, I think I have 
I'm working on my map here. <laughs> okay. So you're saying like this sh as sh surety? Yes, ma'am. 10% is paying through the bailed bonds. Bond. Yes, okay. ma'am. So how does that actually work? Let's say if it's $150,000, what is the bailed bonds going to actually pay? What do they get to keep? Where do they make their money? What's returned? Well, ten per, if the court orders a hundred and fifty thousand surety bond, then a person must come up with ten percent, which is fifteen thousand dollars cash to a bail bondsman. Okay. So, what fees the bail bondsman works out with them, uh, the court's not aware. But the bail bondsman had, is assuring once they put their name on that bond that if that person were to fail to appear, that they would um, try to find them. Um, and a person is required part of their, typically when they are release conditions, they have to kind of stay in touch with their bail bondsman. So sometimes people do forget court. They don't willfully fail to appear. So there are some instances the court may take a warrant under advisement and the tell the defense attorney, you know, try to reach out to your client. And the defense attorneys also will reach out to the bail bondsman because they also have contact information for them as well. Yeah, I think where I'm missing is if it's say a hundred fifty thousand dollar bond. Yes. You're saying that fifteen thousand dollars is all that is actually paid, or ten percent is paid. A person's loved one has to pay ten percent on their behalf to gain their release, and then the bail bondsman is the person that assures the remaining portion okay. of that. system better than we do, does it work as it's configured? And if not, how would you improve it? I, I just gave you an instance where, uh, you know, I lifted a no bond hold and the person failed to appear. So, you know, I, I think we, here in Marion County, again, I think criminal rule 26 is put in place for a lot of smaller counties that have people charged with misdemeanors and low level felony offenses and they're in custody on a no bond hold. Um, I think for the most part, we get it here in Marin County, but of course there's always room for improvement. I mean, we're humans and so we're going to make errors, but we are doing the best to make sure that our jails are not filled with people, like you said earlier, that are charged with you know, they have a $150 cash bond and they really don't have $150 to pay that and it's a theft charge. Like that person shouldn't be sitting in the jail for that. Hi, um, I read a few months ago something about, um, it's in the news, something about um, the situation was getting to where bail bondsmen were um, increasingly finding themselves put in positions of actual danger, their lives, um, because of you know people skipping and then they have to go hunt them down. And um, I, I want to say, and I, I could be, I could have the details all garbled because it has been a few several months, but I want to say there was some situation where. Uh, there were undercover police officers and at least one bail bondsman trying to apprehend this guy and they didn't know about each other pursuing the same guy at the same moment and somebody got shot. I, and the person, I think the person they were trying to apprehend, didn't he also get, he, he, he was, he's charged with killing the bail bondsman, is that correct? Is that you the know, case you're referring it, to? It could be, I want to say it happened on Illinois Street, but I can't, I can't, you know, that I, I, you know, near one of those funeral homes, but I can't, for the life of me, I cannot, I can't remember the rest of the details, but, but I thought, wow, you know, that was really interesting because, um, you know, I mean, and, and it worries me that, I know there have been police officers who are undercover detectives and they can get shot by their comrades who may not realize that that's an officer over there. He may have long hair and all that, but he's, a, he's an officer undercover. I think you're referring to an incident where there was a bail bondsman who was a surety on a person's bond that had failed to appear for court. And the person I'm thinking of had failed to appear, the defendant had a case in court 20, 
Um, it was either Court 20 or Court 21, the other major felony drug and gun court. The bail bondsman went to apprehend this person. The defendant realized that and is alleged to have pulled out his gun and yeah. killed him. And he is now charged with murder also. Yes. That is, that, that was out of Court 20. Yeah, the, I, I now the murder was... case is not in Court 20, right. but the person has been charged. But he was out on bond. He failed to appear for a Court 20 case, a drug dealing offense. I think that was the case. Yes, I Thank think you. so. You're welcome. So it is dangerous being a bail bondsman. Is there an application process where a bail bondsman can turn down somebody? Do they get to speak to them? I don't know about an application process, but I have heard of instances where bail bondsmen will get on a case and then a person picks up another case and the bail bondsmen try to write something and send something to the court saying, or come to the court, that they want to get off the bond because they are in fear. I don't know how, I have not seen that happen a lot, but that does occur. I have heard that and I have seen that before. Well, they can't just get off the bond, but if they have a concern for them being a flight risk, yes, then there's a, they would file something with the court saying that they would like to be off the bond, and then the court would likely set it for a hearing. We'll take one more question, and then we'll conclude the Q&A portion of the session. <laughs> so I'm just curious, what are, the, what are the responsibilities of the bail bonds? And I'm thinking they're just getting this 10% and soaking up gravy, and it sounds like their lives are at risk if the person jumps bail. Well, I can't speak to all of the responsibilities and duties of a bail bondsman, but I can tell you they are, once a person posts 10% on behalf of the defendant, then the bail bondsman is assuring that the defendant will appear in court, and if they don't, then they will try to find the defendant. First and foremost, uh, Judge Flowers can't leave because uh, we're going to turn over the uh, duties of uh, drawing the winners of the prizes to the judge. This, that'll be two weeks in a row we've trusted a judge to do that. <laughs> I really, really appreciate uh, Judge Flowers uh, coming tonight and sharing her experience. Um, and uh, T.K. Morris for stepping up at the last minute. Uh, um, uh, email went out for me this weekend. It was like, uh, Michelle, TK, help. Jason, <laughs> we need help. And I don't know if anyone explained why. Ryan Mears, who was here the first week acting as MC, he's chief trial deputy in our office. Uh, Ryan, Jeremy Johnson, and Salita Scott of our office uh, finished a trial today. They were in a trial for five days of the triple murder that occurred in July of a year ago up at about 75th and Keystone, three young men. Uh, were murdered. Uh, there were five individuals involved in that case. Uh, three of them had pled guilty, and today the jury found the remaining two guilty of all charges in that trial. So that's where uh, Ryan was tonight. And, uh, again, he stepped up to, to fill in.